Arthur Brown Mysteries. Adventures in excitement and suspense. Based on the best-selling novels by the slick storytelling sensation, Carter Brown. Take pride in bringing you the first of a new series, a program drawn from the celebrated books by Carter Brown, which have sold more than 10 million copies and continue to sell at the rate of over a million copies a year. Each week you'll hear a complete story dramatised in the smooth modern style which has been responsible for Carter Brown's enormous popularity both in Australia and abroad. And here, to introduce the Carter Brown Mystery Theatre, is Carter Brown himself. How do you do, ladies and gentlemen? I'm very pleased indeed, and I must admit flattered too, to have been asked to present my stories to you. Uh, Mr. Brown, I know you've led a pretty adventurous life yourself. You've travelled around the world as a salesman, publicity writer, film technician, and now, finally, as a best-selling author. And um, quite a number of people seem to think that the heroes in your stories are really yourself. Now, is that true? No, it's not. And if I sound very definite about that, it's because my wife's listening to me, <laughs> and I don't think she'd like the idea of my running into so many gorgeous blondes, brunettes and redheads as the gentlemen in my books do. <laughs> no, nor, I suppose, into as much trouble as they do. No, I don't think she'd like that either, I hope. <laughs> yes, your heroes certainly do wind up in strife, don't they? Like uh, Johnny Lane, for instance. Johnny's a newspaper columnist, and they've got a premium on problems. Not that they all run into the same kind of bother as Johnny. <laughs> they wouldn't want to. Well, he's a cocky character with an eye for a beautiful babe and printer's ink instead of blood. But suppose you find out for yourselves. Here's Johnny Lane to tell the story which we've titled Call for a Columnist. I was feeling pretty pleased with myself and hence with the world. I had the best table in Jules' night spot, courtesy of Monsieur Jules himself, and on the table was my favorite drink and my favorite reading matter, a copy of the news, open at the best part of the paper, my own column, Dynamite with Johnny Lane, syndicated in 68 newspapers throughout the United States with an estimated 4 million readers. Yes, as far as I was concerned, life was a great big rosy bubble with Johnny Lane riding on top of it. Then the bubble burst. Excuse me, Monsieur Lane. Yes, Jules, my friend, what is it? There are two gentlemen to see you, Monsieur, in my private office. Jules, I never see anyone in your private office, you know that. But these gentlemen are from the police. Oh, well, that makes a difference. Monsieur Lane, I would not like any trouble. Don't worry, I'll handle them. You stick with your customers. Thank you, Monsieur Lane. Well, well, I feel honored, gentlemen. Chief of Police O'Byrne and Captain Stanger in person, and together. Whose piggy bank has been robbed? Got the clown in lane. This is serious. Oh, you intrigue me, Captain. Tell me more. We wanted to talk about your column, Johnny. A subject I am always happy to discuss, Chief. It's about the item concerning Albert Ferraro. I've got a copy here. Uh-huh. You said mobster happy Albert Ferraro won't get around much anymore. Not since he had unexpected visitors at 2 a.m. this morning. Rumor had it that Albert was going to sing to Senator Rowland's committee investigating vice and allied rackets in our fair city. This morbid columnist is betting that Albert sang his swan song in the small hours to an unsympathetic audience with a hay and a hoe and no flowers by request. Who is the Mr. Big who's worried by Senator Rowland's questions? Keep reading this column, folks, and I'll let you know just as soon as I find out. Not bad, Chief. You really haven't got the style for it. Or the voice. This paper was out on the streets at 3 a.m., just one hour after Ferraro had his unexpected visitors. It takes more than an hour to print your paper, Johnny. And that means you put that item in before it happened. Just a hunch, Chief. If I'd been proved wrong, I'd have had to wriggle out of it in tomorrow's column. But you haven't been proved wrong, Johnny. As soon as we read your item, we called on Albert. Guess what? He was at home with a nylon stocking wound round his throat. Tight. Oh, that's what you get for sticking your neck out. Maybe you should see things the way we do, Johnny. 
We have to take Senator Rowland's investigation seriously. The more he uncovers on the vice activities in this city, the worse it looks for the police. Sure, we bust up a lot of small stuff, but the big stuff still goes on and we can't get a lead. So, when we read our paper, we find that the one lead which might really have opened things up for us was never given to us, until it was too late. Oh, come, gentlemen, let's be fair. You got the same opportunities as I have for getting information. Better. If I happen to have outsmarted you on this one, it's, it's no use feeling sore about it, is it? <laughs> you just have to do better next time. Chief, let me bust him on the jaw just once. It wouldn't look good to his four million readers. Johnny, all I want to know is where you got your information from. Sorry, Chief, that's confidential. Now, look, I've got more than a hundred people in this city who hand me information. Two things that are we sure of. Their money and my discretion. What happens if I tell you where the whisper about Albert came from? Word goes around that Lane can't be trusted. My column gets shot to heck. Okay, Johnny, I guess we'll just have to plug on with our own plotting methods. I see you're going to let us know pretty soon who the Mr. Big is. We'll be really interested in that. You got any life insurance, Johnny? Life insurance? What? I was just hoping you got plenty, because I don't think you'll find anybody willing to give you more. You're a bad risk now. I'm afraid I don't quite follow if we're interested in your story about Ferraro, how much more interested do you think Mr. Big is going to be? And when he gets around to asking you about it, I don't think he'll take that confidential routine as an answer. Let's go, Captain. So long, Johnny. Or should it be goodbye? I'm not a nervous character, but as O'Byrne and Stanger walked out, I suddenly found myself dabbing my forehead with a handkerchief. There ought to be a law against policemen going around frightening people. Well, I decided I could use a drink back at my table. Didn't waste time apologizing to the people I knocked over to get there. Monsieur Lane, everything was all right? Uh, yeah, sure, Jules. <laughs> Don't give it another thought. Oh, I am grateful. Uh, Monsieur Lane, there is someone who would like to say hello to you. I never say hello to anyone. That's one of my principles. Hello, Mr. Lane. I turned to look at her, a startlingly beautiful face framed by close-cropped black hair and a set of curves that had sent a racing car driver dizzy. My principal shot through the ceiling. Well, hello. This is the feminine half of the new act I am presenting, the adagio dancers, Simon and Simon. You saw them last night, Mr. Lane. Oh, oh, yeah. Did you like it, Mr. Lane? You bet. Especially the end of it, where he throws you across the floor and you spin out of sight on your, uh, where you spin out of sight. Effective, isn't it? Yeah, and it's a good way to test the floor for splinters. Will you join me? I'd love to. You will excuse me, aren't you? I hope your husband isn't going to take exception to you having a drink with me. My husband? Oh, oh Simon, he is not my husband. Oh, that makes it worse. He is just my partner. That makes it better. I want to say how much I admire you, Mr. Lane, for what you're doing now. You mean holding your hand? Of course not. I mean, in exposing the criminal elements in the town, helping Senator Rolder. Oh, that's nothing. Uh, I'll pour you a drink. I think you are a very brave man. I imagine you carry your life in your hands this very minute. Well, what makes you say that? It's obvious. I'm sure that most of the underworld must get mad at the mere mention of your name. Their only logical solution to stop you printing these revelations is to remove you. Isn't it? No. I can't see any other alternative. Well, well I guess you can. Still, you must know all this, Johnny. I shouldn't be worrying you with it. But I just wanted you to know how much I admire your courage in doing it. Oh, I'll have to go. We're on in 15 minutes. Maybe we could continue this conversation after my act is over. Uh, well, I I've got to get home and get out my column. Can I take a rain check for some other night? Any night, Johnny. Say, tomorrow? My customary cab was waiting outside the night spot. <laughs> Part of the service for a celebrity. I got in and gave the driver the address of my penthouse. It made about two blocks when I noticed he was studying my face in the rear vision mirror. What's the matter, driver? Have I got smallpox? You're Johnny Lane, aren't you? Newspaper guy. Yeah, that's right. 
You want my autograph? No, no, I never get past the punnies. But my wife reads your column. Oh, she like it? Well, I don't know whether she likes it. She don't ever say, but remember they published your photo a couple of months ago? Oh, I believe they did. I asked them not to, but they told me they were sick and tired of the letters demanding to know was I as handsome as they imagined me to be. Yeah, well, the old lady sees it, and she don't believe it. <laughs> it happened to be a good likeness, that's all. That, that's what I'm going to tell her when I get home. She said she didn't believe any guy could look as dumb as that. Here we are. How much do I owe you? We've got 98 cents on the clock, Mr. Lane. Here's a dollar you can keep for change. Hey, what do I do with her two cents? And dow an orphanage. I rode the elevator to the top floor and reached my keys as I moved down the passageway to the penthouse door. I could hear the phone ringing inside and I opened the door in a hurry. Hello? Is that Johnny Lane? No, no, but who's that? <laughs> I'm so glad you published that item I gave you about Albert. Yeah, well, it's got me into a lot of trouble with the police. They want to know how I knew what was going to happen before it happened. Did you tell them? Well, how could I? I don't know myself. All I know is you keep calling me up. You won't tell me who you are. All you do is give me tips for the column. <laughs> Think how it impresses your four million readers. I have no ambition to spend a few years behind bars for the sake of impressing my readers. Don't kid me, Johnny Lane. You'd dive off the Statue of Liberty into the Hudson wearing a bikini if you thought it'd get you another 10,000 circulation. I'll let that pass. I've got another news item for you if you're interested. I'm interested. There's a honky-tonk down on Sloan Street called the Blue Diamond, run by Lou Prager. If the good Senator Rowland would like to know, that's the distribution center for goofballs. So long, Johnny. Hey, wait a minute. It's time you tell me who you are. How can I tell the police my information comes from an anonymous phone call? They just as soon believe people go to see Marilyn Monroe because they like to hear her sing. <laughs> What the... Hey, hang on to yourself, kid. It's under the door. Okay, okay, I'm coming. Just move what? back quietly, Mr. Lane, and we'll close the door. Hey, that's a gun! Your eyesight's 20-20, Mr. Lane. So get inside where we'll be nice and private. <laughs> 